presentation is entitled, What on Earth is Happening? And there's no question mark at the end of that because this is my attempt to explain just that, what on earth is happening on our planet. And recognizing the fact that researchers often stand on the shoulders of giants, men who have come before them, men and women who have done incredible research and put that out into the world, uh, I dedicate my presentation respectfully to the four individuals that you see here uh, who are what I call the four horsemen of my personal apocalypse. These are the four men that were responsible for helping me in uh, awakening myself and uh, in understanding this information. And uh, that is David Icke up in the upper left there. The, to the upper right, Michael Tessarian. On the bottom left, that's Jordan Maxwell. And uh, perhaps more than any other individual uh, who, ins who has inspired me, the late, great Terence McKenna there at the bottom right. So uh, this presentation is respectfully dedicated to these men. Introduction. Truth and lies. Questions and answers. Everything that I'm going to be talking about here today ultimately boils down to one thing. What is the truth about what is taking place here? And that's a big word, that's a big topic to get into. Who am I to discuss what the truth is? Who is anyone to discuss what the truth is? Is there a truth? Well, one of the main concepts in my presentation going forward that I put out there is that there is in fact a truth. And it is that which is. The truth is simply that which is. It is our perceptions of truth that waver from individual to individual. Some resonate with it, some do not. Some come into accordance with truth and some waver radically away from it. But the truth is, it's unwaverable, it's unalterable, it's simply the pure state of being, it's that which is. And it exists, it is knowable. We can come to know what truth is. That is the spiritual journey. So that's what this entire presentation is ultimately about, getting to the truth. Philosophers have often made comments about truth, like William Blake. He said that truth can never be told so as to be understood and not be believed. Poet and author William Blake made that statement. In other words, if you can speak the truth in a way that it is easily understandable to people, they will recognize it as such. Philosopher Arthur Schopenhauer, he said that every truth passes through three stages before it is recognized. In the first stage, it is ridiculed. In the second, it is opposed. And in the third, it is regarded as self-evident. George Bataille said that the truth is paradoxical to the extent of being exactly contrary to the usual perception. Very true statement there. Most people see things often exactly the opposite of how they really are, and they stay attached to that belief because it's more comfortable for them. So the truth can often be seen as paradoxical because it's exactly the opposite in many cases to the usual perception of most people. George Orwell said that during times of universal deceit, telling the truth becomes a revolutionary act. And indeed what you're witnessing is an act of revolution in the times that we live in. The questions for the entire presentation are as follows. These are the questions we'll be really attempting to answer. Who are we? What is the purpose of human life? Why do we hold the beliefs that we do about ourselves and the world? Why do we act the way that we do toward ourselves and others? What is happening in the world today and why? Why, most importantly. And finally, how can we improve ourselves and by doing so improve the world in which we live? Because ultimately, uh, I believe that 
is most people's goal in life if they're a truly self-examined individual. They want to improve themselves and they want to improve the world, leave this world a better place than they found it. So these are the greatest questions that humanity has ever asked of itself. And these questions have answers. These questions are answerable. The answers are out there. The answers are discoverable. It's up to us to discover the answers to these questions. So the enemy of all truth, if you're on a quest for the truth, there are blockages, there are, there are roadblocks involved, and uh, lies and deception come up all the time when one is uh, going off in search of the truth. So uh, we want to understand how that dynamic works in this process. If there's anybody who knew a lot about lying and evil, it was this man, Adolf Hitler. He, he made this comment about a lie. He said, make the lie big. Make it simple. Keep saying it and eventually they will believe it. A technique of, for propaganda. If anyone knew more about lying than even Hitler, it was this man, the, the, the Nazi minister of propaganda during the Third Reich, Paul Josef Goebbels. He said, the bigger the lie, the more it will be believed. Contrary to what you would think, you make the lie even bigger, even more extravagant, even more encompassing, and more people will actually believe that. Which brings me to the concept of the biggest lie. So the biggest lie that we can ever be sold or that we can ever personally buy is simply the lie that there is no truth, or even if there is, it's undiscoverable. So why bother to even go out and search for it? This ties in with the philosophy of moral relativism, and it's a dangerous and slippery slope when you go down that path, because if there is no truth, then there is no right or wrong either. So there is a truth. It is knowable by us. It is our job to find out what the truth is. So if you buy the biggest lie that there's no truth out there to discover, that it's all just um, perception, then you're headed down a path in which there is no right or wrong either. And it's up to anybody to decide, you know, what they think is appropriate given any particular situation. They're not really making a decision that is born in true conscience. It's just what is right for me, I'm going to do, regardless of the consequences, consequences because I don't believe that there is actual truth to live in harmony with. So that's the most dangerous lie of all to buy. And unfortunately, most people in the world have bought this lie, that there is no truth. And therefore, the spiritual journey for them never really begins because they're never really striving for something beyond themselves. So it's a very important thing to overcome and to get past before you go deeper into this journey. You have to believe the truth indeed does exist. Otherwise, you're not really actively searching for it. So in our search for truth, where do we go for answers? What sources do we have to go to? Well, most people go to what I call the big four, and uh, they are politics, religion, science, and the New Age movement. And each one of these is a, an, uh, an ideological system. It's a, an institutionalized system of thought. And each one of them differs in various ways, but uh, most people will go to one of these four institutionalized systems in their search for truth. And what I'm going to talk about in my presentation here today will touch upon all of these institutionalized systems. However, it cannot fit in nicely into any of these boxes because that's what they are. They're boxes for consciousness. They are paradigms. They're acceptable ways of looking at the world outside of which it is discouraged to look outside of. So uh, if you're looking into any one of these given systems of thought specifically, 
you're not going to find the whole truth encompassed within any one of these systems of thought. Because that's what they are. They're systems. They're boxes. They're, they're, they're confines, so to speak. And the truth is too big to be put in a box. It exists outside of any boxes, outside of any limitations. So we have to expand our perceptions to look beyond uh, all of the uh, current social and uh, political and religious paradigms and scientific paradigms in the world if we're really going to endeavor to find truth. So the truth is outside of all of these. We cannot limit ourselves to any one specific institutionalized thought system if we're truly serious in our search for the truth. So part one, I'm going to start with the solution. I, this presentation is in three sections. Part one is the solution. Part two, we examine the problem. And then part three, we talk about how to actually apply the solution to get the desired outcome. So I'll begin with part one, the solution. And the solution for the problems that humanity currently faces is indeed a raising of consciousness. Consciousness must be raised on a global scale. But to do that, the way that that is done is by raising it on an individual scale. Within each individual, consciousness must be raised. And as each individual consciousness is raised, Global consciousness is raised. But in talking about consciousness and why this is the solution to all of the problems that humanity faces, most people don't really understand what consciousness is. They, they think of it as simply being physically awake. Yes, we have physical awake consciousness because we're awake, we're alert. But consciousness is much more than just a state of being physically awake. So we need a definition for consciousness as we go forward in the presentation. And uh, I, I'd like to uh, encapsulate how I feel about consciousness. This is a, uh, a quote that is on the oracle uh, at Delphi in Greece. This is uh, uh, words that are inscribed upon the Delphic oracle. Heed these words. You who wish to probe the depths of nature, if you do not find within yourself that which you seek, neither will you find it outside. If you ignore the wonders of your own house, how do you expect to find other wonders? In you is hidden the treasure of treasures. Know thyself, and you will know the universe and the gods. So this is one of my favorite quotes because it, it tells the whole story, essentially. We need to know ourselves. All knowledge of value ultimately is self-knowledge. And this is what we lack globally. We lack this as an as a entire species. And this is why we're in so much trouble today. This is why we're in the dark situation that we're in. Because we lack self-knowledge. We need to understand ourselves and our motivations and our desires and, and what makes us tick if we're really going to have any kind of happiness, success, or peace in our lives. And the ancients understood this, and they encapsulated it perfectly in a statement like that and in the, the uh, buildings and in the architecture that they put together. Uh, perhaps they were more connected uh, with consciousness and with their own self-knowledge than we are today. So uh, this, is, this next slide is a, a dictionary definition of what consciousness is. Uh, an encyclopedia or a dictionary says that consciousness is the characteristics of a being generally regarded to comprise qualities such as subjectivity, self-awareness, sentience, sapience, and the ability to perceive the relationship between oneself and one's environment. Now that's an excellent definition of what consciousness is in, in my estimation, but it's a bit complex. There's a lot of words there. And instead of going into each word and breaking it down and defining it separately, we can take that as 
a, a, a pretty good definition of what consciousness is, but for the purposes of this presentation, I would like to just simplify it and take it down to a, a simpler level. So with that in mind, this is the definition of consciousness that I'm going to use going forward in this presentation. Consciousness is simply the ability of a being to recognize patterns and meaning with respect to events taking place, both within oneself and in the realm in which the self exists and operates. In other words, consciousness is the ability to understand information understand events that are taking place, the implications of them, and internal events and information as well as external worldly events and information. It is the ability to recognize patterns within information. That's the, my definition of consciousness as I'm using it in this presentation, so we want to keep that in mind as we move forward. The ancients had different symbols that they used for consciousness and energy. And uh, this is one of them. This is uh, called the Tao. Uh, some may know it as the yin and the yang. And this represented the all, everything, because everything is conscious. Everything is consciousness ultimately. It's all energy. And there are different mixtures of different types of energies. And uh, the Taoist um, um, philosophy codified this in this symbol. The, the, uh, the Tao, the yin yang, by um, a mixture of two basic polar energies, one being light, one being dark, one being male, one being female. They called these the yin and yang. Now, yang is on the left there, and it's solar. It has to do with light, the sun. It's masculine in its qualities. It's active. It's more analytical, and, and it's a dominant energy. It's more left brain. We're going to talk about the structure of the brain later on. And it can, it can be aggressive. It's, it's, it's dominant. It's active. It's a, a male thrusting principle. Okay? The, the darker energy, yin, is associated with the moon, which is up at night, okay? at, when it's dark. It's a feminine, a more feminine or passive energy. It relates more with intuition than with analytical thought or, log or logic. It's more submissive than dominant. It's more right-brained. And it deals with concepts of compassion and nurturing. So the ancients looked at this as these are the qualities that are in all of us, not just men and women. It's not just male or female. This masculine and feminine energy is indwelling in all of us, whether we are male or female. And we have to strike a blend, a perfect blend, or an equilibrium of these two types of energies, male and female, yang and yin. So what we're going to talk about later is how one of these energies is really seemingly dominating the other more in the modern world. Another um, uh, mode or another um, uh, symbol that the ancients uh, used to explain what consciousness was is the triangle. Because they recognized that consciousness was a threefold aspect within an individual. Basically, an individual expresses their consciousness in three basic ways. And all other ways that they express themselves are offshoots or variants of these three basic modalities of consciousness. So in, in the ancient world, this was known as the law of three, or the, the triune aspect of the individual. And here's what they are. Our thoughts, our emotions, and our actions. See, our thoughts are the creator of our experience. Everything that exists has to first exist as a thought to come into manifestation. So our thoughts can be seen as the creator God, the creator of our experience. So I have it labeled here the Father of the Trinity of thought, emotion, and action. And thoughts arise from 
what we call mind. The second part is our emotions. This is the yin aspect of consciousness. Okay, so the thoughts are the, the holistic quality. It's the essence. Emotions are the yin as, aspect. This is the feminine aspect of consciousness. This is the spirit in which we do things, our emotions. So this is the sacred feminine, or the mother of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, if you will. Okay? This is the internalized expression of our consciousness, how we feel. And then there's the male aspect, what we do. So we have a thought, we feel a certain way about it, and then we take action in the world in relation to our thoughts and emotions. So our actions are the third aspect of our consciousness. And we perform actions with the body. And since it's a male principle, this is the yang energy, it's considered the offspring of our thoughts and our emotions. So it is the child of the father and the mother. And it's a male principle, so it's a male child, the son. So this could be seen as the divine child of the Trinity. Thoughts being the creator God, the emotions being the sacred feminine mother, and then our actions being the male offspring of those two, the divine male child, the son. So the next part of the presentation is going to deal with uh, how consciousness manifests itself through our physiology and the structure of the human brain because it's extremely important to understand the structure of the brain and how the, the different complexes within the brain function if we're going to understand what's really going on within us. So this is a uh, schematic diagram of the human brain and it shows that the brain is basically broken down into three sub-complexes. We have, in effect, three small brains working in unison as one whole uh, brain complex. And the three um, complexes within the brain are the R complex, or the reptile brain. You see it here at the bottom, and it is basically the brain stem and the cerebellum, the dark part right behind the brain stem, right here, the cerebellum, and this is the brain stem. So, <clears throat> this part of the brain governs our survival instincts. It has to do with uh, our motor skills. It has to do with um, all things that we interact with in the physical world, movement, um, uh, basic um, survival techniques, uh, the, the necessity for food, to take food and nutrients into the body, um, shelter, clothing, warmth, etc. So the reptile brain is geared toward the physical, the physical world. And it is, it, it is focused upon survival. That's what helps us to focus on the physical things that we need to do to survive on a day-to-day -day basis. The R complex or the reptile brain. So the second subcomplex of the brain is the mammalian brain or the limbic brain. And this is the part of the brain that basically governs our emotions. It, it, it makes our it makes our emotions capable of being expressed through our body. In other words, it pumps all of the chemicals, the neuropeptides, into the body from this part of the brain that makes us feel the consequences of what we do in the world. So this is the, um, the limbic brain, and it can be seen as the uh, intuitive part of the brain since it generates our emotions. Uh, it's comprised of the... Um, hypothalamus, uh, the hippocampus, the amygdala, and the, the pineal and pituitary glands. So uh, that's the midbrain. And um, there, there's a, a third part of the brain that most people, when they see it, they, they think that that is the entire brain, the, the, the gray matter of the brain. And 
it is simply one of the complexes of the brain, but it is by far the most complex and by far the part of the brain that gives us our human qualities, and that is the neocortex. It's called the human brain. This is the part of the brain that is responsible for higher order thinking within a human being. It makes higher order thinking possible. All of the things that distinguish us from the animal kingdom, it, it, it takes place within the neocortex. Art, science, music, uh, speech, verbal and written communication, all neocortical functions. So these three parts of the brain can also be seen to be symbolic analogs of consciousness, of the trinity of consciousness, as we have already talked about. See, the reptile complex of the brain is based upon control. It's the part of the brain that makes us want to control our environment so that we survive. And this can be seen as the Old Testament God obsessed with law, obsessed with regimen, with control. So it's the dominator aspect of the brain. A reptile is a creature of instinct, without emotion, cold-blooded, just focused on survival. The sacred feminine part of the brain, what I correlate to the Holy Spirit, is the midbrain, the, the limbic system, the limbic brain, the mammal brain. So. It is um, what generates our emotions, the spirit in which we do things. So that's the feminine aspect of, of the brain complex. And then the, the most important part of the brain by far is the neocortex because that's, what, that's where all of our human qualities are, are, are really derived out of the activity that takes place within this part of the brain. Without the neocortex, we wouldn't be able to do any of the things that make us human. So this can be seen as the, the light, the thing that truly separates us from, from the animal kingdom. And it is the, the sun, the divine child, it's the product of these other two brains, with the reptile complex being the father, the limbic system being the mother, and then they bear the divine child, the neocortex, the light of the world, so to speak, because uh, the prefrontal neocortex was known as the third eye. And uh, by the ancients, and this is the part of the brain that is responsible for our highest order thinking, and it's the seat of higher consciousness in the physiology. So these three parts of the brain, the triune brain, as it's called in the scientific world, is a, a symbolic analog to the aspects of consciousness and the, and the types of energy that we talked about when we talked about the Tao. So, absolutely important to understand how these components function and what happens if they become imbalanced, which we'll talk about later in the presentation. Now, to understand that, we have to understand that the neocortex itself is bilaterally symmetrical. It's divided down the middle, it's in two distinct parts, two distinct halves, and they're called brain hemispheres. So there's a left hemisphere and a right hemisphere, and they, uh, they govern different functions of an individual. So the left brain of an individual governs things like logic, uh, analytical thought processes, verbal communication, our language, mathematics and science, okay? Uh, anything that requires analysis and logic, okay? So it's the masculine side of the brain. Hard facts, hard fig figures, physical worldliness, reason. Okay? The right brain functions entirely differently. It's more holistic. It governs holistic thoughts, spiritual thought. It is intuitive. It's where our intuition is derived from. It's the creative center of the individual. So artistic uh, uh, capability is derived from this part of the brain. All kinds of creativity, music, etc., art comes from this part of the brain. So it, it, it's the feminine aspect of the brain. So you have a male side of the brain and you have a female side of the brain. And 
It isn't that one is better than the other. It's that they need to be balanced just like the yin and yang energies. They need to be balanced to come to a state of wholeness, of working in unison with each other, and equilibrium. And that's a truly um, ordered individual, a, a person who really um, it is truly awake in consciousness, has a balanced brain. They're, they're using both brain hemispheres in conjunction with each other. When that is done, the prefrontal neocortex that, that governs the highest order thinking within the individual really comes online. And uh, that's kind of the opening of the third eye, so to speak. And that only happens when these two brain uh, hemispheres come into coherence with each other. And a little bit later, I'm going to talk about what happens if these brain hemispheres are radically out of balance with each other. What happens if one side really is dominating the other? And there's very little activity taking place in one hemisphere of the brain, but a whole lot on the other. And uh, not too uh, unpleasant things begin to occur, things that aren't too good in our experience uh, begin to happen. Uh, when the brain is in significant states of imbalance. So, I'll be talking about that later. Again, the left brain is the yang energy, and the right brain is the yin energy in correlation to Taoism. So, the, uh, the symbols for these, which will become important as we go forward and talk about symbology, are uh, the upward pointing triangle. In the ancient world, the upward pointing triangle seen here was known as the blade. This is a, uh, a symbol representing male energy, or yang energy. Uh, it's a rudimentary phallic symbol. It's uh, an, an upward pointing triangle. It's, uh, it's like a, the tip of a spear, okay? Or it's, a, uh, like I said, a rudimentary phallic symbol. These are thrusting elements, a spear, a penis, uh, male active thrust, okay? Um, the opposite of that, yin energy, is the inverted triangle. Okay, So you just are taking it and you're using its opposite, an inverted triangle. This is like the shape of a womb, the shape of the, the lower portion of the female anatomy that, that bears children. You know, it, it's like a, a chalice that holds uh, wine or blood. You know, the holy grail is a, a, a concept of uh, of this uh, inverted triangle. It was known as the chalice in the ancient world. So you have the blade, and that represents the yang energy, the left brain, and then the, the chalice, the inverted triangle, that represents the yin energy, or the right brain. So keep those symbols in mind, uh, and how they correlate to consciousness, and how they correlate to the brain as we go forward, because we will be seeing them again. The next concept I'll talk about is polarity. So polarity is how seemingly opposite forces work in the world, and I'm going to talk about how they're really, the, the differences between them are really illusion. That there really is only one ultimate force that's at work in the world, but it kind of has split itself in two, and it works in, in different ways to really uh, help us to have an experience uh, in the physical world. So. Polar forces could be looked at as hot and cold, good and evil, uh, young and old, um, uh, hot and cold. Uh, let's take uh, light and dark as an example. It's only one thing, light and dark. They're not really opposites. There is only light energy. See, there's either, it's either present or it's not present, in which case you have darkness. You can't go into a completely lit room and shine darkness into a room. There's no such thing as a darkness flashlight, right? Because uh, darkness is simply the absence of light energy. So there's only light energy. We look at light and dark as two polar opposites, but they're really not. There's really only one thing there. There's only light or its absence. So that's the going forward with this section, that's what I want you to keep in mind. The things that we really see as opposites, as really warring against each other, energies that are warring against each other are really only one thing. Or it's its absence. 
uh, scientist, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Masaru Emoto, I believe is his name, uh, does experimentations with water crystals where um, he exposes simple water um, to energies, to vibratory energies, to emotions. And he then takes the uh, water molecules and he photographs them under high magnification to see if their structure changes depending on proximity to certain forms of consciousness like a uh, high level of joy or high level of fear or anger, things like that. And this uh, beautifully organized water molecule crystal that you see here um, formed when uh, the scientist placed water in the presence of uh, high joy and love within certain individuals. So it became ordered. And this brings us to the first polarity. Okay, the first polarity is that which brings order and is the good emotion. We only basically have two emotional polarities. Every other feeling that you could possibly feel is an extension of one of these two basic polar emotional forces at work in the world. So the first one is that which makes us feel good and it's what, that which brings order. And it is the energy of love, the polarity of love. And giving a, an idea of what I mean by the love polarity, the love energy uh, going forward throughout this presentation, is it is not these, this a Hollywood or romance novel uh, idea of love. It is the expansive force of consciousness. If you look at the images here, it's individuals that have opened themselves up to what is and are in harmony with that which is, with truth, uh, and with understanding and knowledge and light. And um, it, consciousness uh, and love is that aspect of consciousness, uh, the expansive aspect of consciousness, that which flowers and does this and opens up, opens us up to that which is. That's what love really is, okay? It's, it's polar opposite is the opposite of the energy that makes us feel good and which brings order. This is the energy that makes us feel bad when we experience it and which brings to our experience chaos and disorder and disarray and pain and suffering. And it's interesting that the scientist Emoto took water, the same water that he had just previously exposed uh, to, to a high vibratory energy of consciousness and love and joy, and he then exposed it to people totally in shut down consciousness, fighting amongst themselves in fear and anger and just being generally nasty to each other. And this is what the same water ended up looking like. The crystalline structure completely broke down and there was just chaos in, in, in the structure of the water. And it shows you that our emotions and what we think and what we do have an effect on the physical world. The, the external reality is a reflection of what's really going on inside of us. So this is water that's been exposed to the negative emotional polarity. And that emotional polarity is fear. Fear is the opposite polarity of love. It is the absence of love to varying degrees. And this is the force, this is the polarity that brings disorder into our experience. It brings chaos when it arrives within us. It can never create order. Love is the polarity that brings order. Fear is the polarity that brings chaos. This is the energy that shuts consciousness down. Like love does this and it opens it up, fear does this and it closes it down and it keeps it suppressed, okay? So, these two basic emotional polarities, love and fear, are what really create everything around us, depending on how much we're in harmony with each of them. And they have 
each an internal manifestation and they each have an external manifestation. So love has a manifestation that happens within us and then outward in the world. And fear has a manifestation that happens within us and then outward in the world. We're going to talk about those. So we'll talk about the internal polarities next, the internally expressed polarities of fear of love and fear. So when love reaches a crescendo or a, a highest expression within an individual, within an individual, okay? I, I have a, a term that I call this. It's a concept that as you think, so you feel internally and so you act in the world. See, there's no, there's no separation within you, right? As you think, so you feel, so you act. And I call this concept dominion. It means that you are in rulership of the only thing you're really allowed to be in rulership of. You're in rulership of the kingdom of self. As you think, so you feel, so you act. Th those three aspects of consciousness are in unison within you. And no one can tear them apart. No one can divide them or conquer them. People can't get you to do something that you don't feel is right. You act in a way that you say you think and feel, and then you act that way in the world. There's no contradiction within. That's the state of dominion. Its opposite is when fear runs rampant within an individual, and you have opposition within the self. The consciousness is shut down. The individual does not really understand what's taking place within themselves or around them because they're, they're essentially unconscious. The opposite of conscious, consciousness being the ability to recognize patterns taking place within and outside of oneself. Uh, uh, this uh, fear uh, that runs rampant within an individual, it reaches a crescendo or it reaches a, uh, a, a final expression within an individual. And this is, what, this is the state of confusion. Confusion is the internal polarity of fear residing within an individual. An individual goes into a state of shutdown and confusion. They do not understand themselves and they do not understand the world. And often when they're in this state, they don't want to do any learning because they're operating in lower forms of consciousness. And that's not where we can really do learning and to, to get out of this mode, which it becomes like a cyclical process. The individual becomes trapped in it. So these two polarities, love and fear, have an external manifestation. This is extremely important two of the most key concepts that I'm going to be discussing going forward in the presentation I'm going to talk about right now. When love, the, the polar energy of love, reaches a, uh, uh, um, uh, its highest vibratory state within individuals, the community around the individuals be, begins to express something. And something be, is becoming born in the external world when individuals have the love energy dwelling within them. And this is the highest expression of love manifested outwardly in the outside world that we see in our experience. And that is freedom. Freedom is the highest goal of the quest for truth of the spiritual quest. It is one and the same as the quest for the divine. And if spiritual teachers aren't really teaching that to people, I don't believe that they're doing their job because it's all about freedom and about very little else. Freedom is what the end result is all about. Okay? It is the highest expression of love in the world around us. When love is present within an individual, they are working toward true freedom. The opposite of this force, the opposite of this manifestation in the outside world, 
is if fear rules within the individual. The, the essence of fear rules. The individual goes into the state of confusion within. So the polar energy of fear is ruling their consciousness, it's shutting consciousness down, and then internally they're in that state of confusion. When someone is in a shut down state of consciousness and confused, the way that they then almost invariably act in the external world is the desire for control. Control is the polarity of fear that reaches its highest expression and then is born out into the external world. And it is based on the dynamic of fear. It is based on the polar vibratory energy of fear. Not strength, not power, but fear. A controller wants control because he is in fear. External control is an illusion. It does not exist anywhere in three-dimensional manifestation. It is a complete illusion that we buy into because our consciousness is shut down through fear and confusion. And this dynamic cannot ever create order in the world being based on fear. You saw what fear does to the water molecules and ultimately it creates chaos in the external world. The only way that we would be able to create order is through freedom. Impossible to do it through control because control is based in fear and fear creates chaos as we've seen. If you're going to create order in the world, the only way to ever do it is to do it by attempting to create freedom in the world because freedom is based on the polar energy of love. It is based on the dynamic of love and that is the force which brings order and peace and prosperity. Trying to create any kind of control through any kind of order through control is only going to get you chaos. It cannot ever create order or peace. So with that being said, the next concept to understand is direction. We understand how these polar forces work, what they do in the ex in, within ourselves and in the external world. We have to ask ourselves some basic questions about the direction of our lives and how we've lived, how we are living, and what We'll con we'll, if we continue on the path we're on, what we're likely to see in the future. So we're looking for our compass. We're looking for our emotional compass, okay? The direction that we want to set ourselves in in life. And we can do this, we can try to set this compass for direction by asking some basic questions. Are we moving toward an expression of love or are we moving toward an expression of fear? Both within and in the outside world. What, what one, which one of those basic polar forces are we really moving toward, if we are honest with ourselves? Based on our available knowledge of ourselves and the world around us, we have to make an honest appraisal of where we are and where we are headed. We have to have an understanding of the past, a, not studying the past is, is extremely dangerous because those who don't understand what has happened in the past, it is very true that they are often doomed to repeat it in cyclical, in cycles, because they don't get the lesson. So an understanding of what happened in our past can help us to orient our direction for the future. We should learn from the past, from the mistakes of the past. But most importantly in the, uh, uh, analyzing uh, and trying to come to um, an understanding of what sets our direction in life, we have to really grasp and understand that our emotions are the most critical factor. Our emotions are our compass for direction in life. When we feel an emotion, it's because it's trying to tell us either continue to do that thing or do not continue to do that thing. The emotions are the compass. That's why it's called compassion. Compass is in the word, compassion. Compass, passion, emotion. So our emotions 
are our compass for direction in life. If we numb them out, if we seek to not feel them, we're throwing our compass away and we're lost in the wilderness. So your emotions are there to be felt, not to be numbed out as many people are striving to do in the modern world. There are, there are our guide, so to speak. There are our markers through the wilderness that we're in. And we need them and we need to cultivate them and feel them, not numb them out. So worldview is the next concept to grasp. And this really is what most people suffer from. Uh, a poisoned worldview, as I'll talk about in part two. See, our, it, it's just what it says. It's our view of the world. How we view ourselves in relation to the world. How we view others in relation to ourselves. So, just like the polar energy forces that we talked about in polarity, there's a positive worldview, and then there's a negative worldview. So the positive worldview is one that sees ourselves as, yes, an individual, unique expression of individuality, the monad of consciousness, if you will, the individual unit. But it recognizes that we are unique, and we're an expression of the whole, and we're part of the whole. When that drop is in the whole ocean, there's no separation. It is the same consciousness, it is the same energy, it is the same substance, it's made of the same thing. And we need to see the world more in that holistic sense if we're going to come through these problems that we're facing, that we see in the external world. It's because we see ourselves as fundamentally separate from everyone else. See, it doesn't mean we have to lose our uniqueness. We can still understand that we're completely unique, like a beautiful snowflake, and there's only one like that. You know, it's not to throw away the idea of individuality, because that is of total importance. That is of critical import to understand that each individual is a unique expression of consciousness within the whole. So the, the value of the individual is infinite, and it must be respected at all times. But it's not to say that the individual shouldn't also understand that they are part of a living system. See, we belong to the whole system of the earth, the whole complex that is this living, breathing planet. We can't separate ourselves from our environment, from our ecosystem. We belong to it. We are part of it. And human nature, you know, th this is really what worldview really gets down to. How do we see human nature? Do we think of human nature as fundamentally flawed? Do we think of it as fundamentally evil or vile? You know, I think this is what human nature really looks like once all the uh, external uh, tapestries are stripped away and all the non-essentials are stripped away. Human nature is fundamentally good, not fundamentally evil or flawed. This is, that's a poisoned worldview. If we're, if we're to heal the problems within ourselves and in our, our social uh, structure, we need to uh, recognize human nature for what it is. It's good. It's all the conditioning and the mind control factors that go into poisoning a person through information that they take in over the course of their lives that, that makes them do the things that they do, the harmful things that they do. It isn't that that's human nature. And uh, we need to really be focused on working toward true freedom if, if our worldview is a positive one and if we really understand what we're here to do and what um, and, uh, what a positive worldview is really seeking to, to create, to accomplish. When we take this worldview, this positive, connected worldview, this unified, non-dual worldview, these are the states that emerge. Higher levels of consciousness and awareness, dominion within the self, understanding of our motivations, our desires, and, and states like this is what emerges, what you see here. Peace, harmony, justice, truth, freedom, order, 
They can only be created with a positive worldview. The opposite worldview is a negative or a dark worldview, a poisoned worldview as I call it. So it's the worldview that you know sees that, again, that little drop up there as completely cut off and separate from the whole. Uh, this is one big, huge mass of consciousness, but I'm completely separate from it, and I have no relationship to that whole. You know, I'm just a number. I'm, I'm a, one of the faces in a, ma a mass of faces, and I can't really affect any change. I'm just a number. I'm powerless. Uh, my, my nature is fundamentally flawed. We come into the world in a state of corruption and sin and, you know, brokenness. And you take this worldview, it, your life will become a reflection of that worldview. You will, your consciousness will slowly begin to shut down until you're in a state that resembles sleep or hypnosis. And you will have all kinds of susceptibility to techniques of mind control, which I'll be talking about. And when we take this negative worldview, then we want to lash out against everyone else. We're cut off. We're separate from everybody else. We're in a state of internal confusion because our consciousness is shut down. And then we want control. We want to feel better about ourselves by taking external control over someone else. And all that's doing is ignoring the basic problem. The basic problem that a controller does not know oneself. They don't really understand the modalities of consciousness that are indwelling within them. And because they're in that state of internal confusion, then they seek for external control over others. You're only going to create chaos, suffering, disorder, disharmony, and ultimately enslavement by looking at the world in that way. These are the states that a negative worldview brings into manifestation, a being that is shut down in fear, totally oppressed, or looking to oppress others, like a sorcerer or a big brother type. So that is worldview. The next concept I'm going to introduce is magic versus sorcery. These are very real forces. These are very real energies that are, that are being used all around us at all times in the world. And um, they're, they're very real, but they're quite different from the Hollywood interpretation or definition. Um, a real magician or sorcerer isn't you know, casting lightning bolts from his fingertips, but he is using forces at work in the world to create what he wishes to create. And here's the definition of magic. This is what magic actually is in the real world. Magic is a science. It's, it's a science and art of influencing change to occur in accordance with the will. Now that's a very important term there at the end. Will with a capital W. Okay? Whole books, whole volumes have pretty much been written about what that means. And this does not mean the practitioner's egoic will my will, my desire, what I want to see happen, what I want to see done. This is the will of the energy of creation. It is the will of love. It is the will of that polar force that wants to create order, the divine intelligence inherent in creation, in the energy of creation. Now, you can call that whatever you want. I have no problem calling that God. I have no problem calling that the divine. This is the divine will. But you could think of it however you wish to think of it. Um, so that's what magic is. The science and art of influencing change to occur in accordance with the will, capital W, the divine will. Let thy will be done, not my egoic will. Okay? Magic's goal is the state of non-dualism. We talked about this before. This is the state of dominion, the state of not being able to be torn apart internally. This is the state of as you think, so you feel, and so you act. You are non-dual. You are one within. 
your three aspects of your consciousness are one and cannot be torn apart. As you think, so you feel, so you act. That is magic's goal. A true magician is trying to bring the state of non-dualism into being, not only within himself, but with anyone else that he may have the ability to influence and inspire. And the process of this of a, 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 a magician's process to create the state of non-dualism is known as alchemy. And alchemy is not this medieval concept of turning actual metals, base metals, into gold. This is an allegory. This is a symbolic allegory of helping to raise base consciousness into solar consciousness, into divine consciousness, you know, non-dual consciousness. Uh, harmonic with the with the resonant energy of love, of order, of a unified brain, the unified male and female energies. So that's what an alchemist is really trying to do. He is attempting to inspire others and be an influence for them to raise their consciousness up to a higher level. That's what the process of alchemy is, and that's a magician's vehicle for doing his work to accomplish non-dualism. The opposite of magic is sorcery. And as you see here, the definition is almost identical. Sorcery is the science and art of influencing change to occur in accordance with the will. And you'll notice that the will is no longer capitalized, lowercase w, okay, because this form of will is not the capital W will. It is not the divine energy. It is not the divine aspect of creation, the divine will. This is the sorcerer's own egoic desires. What I want, what I want to accomplish for my ends. Let not thy will be done, let my will be done. So sorcery also has a goal. And what it is trying to, to create and bring into the world is the state of opposition. Opposition is the state when polar forces are at war with each other and there is struggle, there is conflict, there is suffering, there is chaos. Moreover, it means that sorcery wants to create and a sorcerer wishes to create an opposition within an individual. This is the opposition that takes place within us. We don't, we aren't unified uh, in the way we think, feel, and act. We may think a certain way or feel a certain way about something, and yet we do something that's in opposition to that. So we're torn apart from within. The three aspects of our consciousness are not unified as one. They are torn apart. So in that aspect, the person is in internal opposition where they are crucified within themselves, it can, it can be seen as. And the actual methodologies that are used to accomplish this state of opposition, both within an individual and in the external world, is the sorcerer's tools of illusion and manipulation. It is getting people to believe in something that simply is not real and that does not serve their interest in the world, does not serve who we are and, and how we are really meant to live. And it creates disharmony and strife and suffering in the world. But they want to try to get people to believe that way because it may benefit them. Even though it doesn't benefit the whole, it may benefit them so that they profit and they come out on top and everyone else suffers. That's what a sorcerer is really trying to do. And uh, they use illusion and manipulation, playing people off against each other, manipulating them, getting them to see things that they want them to, in a way that they want them to see it, getting them to believe in things that aren't real, don't serve them, and yet then people develop an attachment to it. And that's really what creates all suffering. So that's what magic and sorcery is really about as they are used in the real world. So the next concept in consciousness that we have to understand is what really keeps us 
as a species in a state of general unconsciousness? What are the barriers to our self-realization? And look at the word realization. I'll be talking a lot about the meaning of words going forward in the presentation. To use one's real eyes, to realize something. When we realize it, we are making it real, realizing it. Okay? So it's bringing something into manifestation. Well, what are our barriers to realizing the true self, the true essence of who we are? The barriers to the realization of the true self. Okay? Not the egoic self, but the real essence of who we are. Here are the four main barriers to the realization of the true self. The five sense illusion, ego identification, the prison of the left brain, and institutionalized belief systems, which we've already talked a bit about. So I'll take them in order. The five sense illusion is the first barrier to the realization of the true self. This is the idea that only what we are able to perceive with our sensory organs is real. And anything that lies outside of that sense perception cannot exist. That's what this concept is, the five sense illusion. This first image over here on the left is the, uh, the uh, visible bandwidth of light energy that we are able to see and decode as color in the human eye. And you, you see, this is a blow up of it here, but over here, this little strip right here, okay, is in fact, all of the visible colors of light that the human eye can perceive. There is an infinity in the spectrum to the left and the right of, of frequencies that the human eye cannot decode as color, yet they exist. Sound is another example. Take a dog whistle as an example. You blow a dog whistle, your ear does not hear the sound, yet a dog's ear does. That's because your ear is tuned to a different vibratory bandwidth of frequencies than is a dog's ear. Does that mean that no sound is coming out of the whistle that you're blowing? Of course not. The sound vibration exists. It's traveling through the ear. It's actually reaching your ear. Your ear just can't decode it as sound. That doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Our identification with the solidity of matter most people do not realize that matter is nothing but solid. It's nothing like anything solid. Matter is almost entirely empty space. The atom is almost entirely empty space. The nucleus of an atom, if you made it the size of a, of a baseball, the electrons, what we you know, term the electron shells, would be city blocks away. From, from the nucleus, and all, all in between is empty space, vacuum. If you took a subatomic particle of an atom and looked at it under enormously high power, powerful uh, magnification, we don't even have the technology to do that. Scientists understand that these uh, subatomic particles that comprise all matter are really vibratory energy. They're just, they're just a, a, a a wave of energy vibrating very quickly like a little rubber band. This is string theory. And think of it like a telephone cord. If you took a telephone cord or a jump rope, okay, and just kept whip, whipping it faster and faster and faster and faster and faster and faster, eventually you can make it look like there was a ball there if you were able to, move, to, to whip it around fast enough, but it's not a solid object. You have a very, very thin, thin, uh, unidimensional piece of rope or strand or string and it's just vibrating and it's taking a form by the way it's vibrating. Matter is the same way. Matter is not solid. It's simply energy and vibration. And everything is made of this. From the smallest cells, the smallest single cell organisms to entire galaxies. We are made of this. We are not solid. We are energy taking a form through vibration. Okay, so to un we have to understand that if we're going to get past this five sense illusion of only what we see and perceive 
you know, to our limited sensory organs is real. It simply is not true. A great experiment that really helps one to understand that matter isn't really solid and that our consciousness is really what determines the outcome of how we perceive and experience the physical world is the double slit experiment, the quantum physics double slit experiment. You could go online and look that up and watch a video about it, but I'll briefly describe it here. Scientists take um, very, very small bits of uh, matter, like let's say you, let's say you took a, uh, a little um, ball bearing and you shot it through two slits, as you see up here. You get a pattern on the other wall, okay, that looks like two slits from where they went through and they struck the measuring device on the other side. Okay, so that's this first image here. Very small pieces of matter, like let's say ball bearings or pellets, you shoot shooting them through a shield with two slits in it, and that's the pattern they form on the other side. Now, when scientists do this with electrons, which are very, very, very small bits of matter, part of an atom, a subatomic particle of an atom, which is what matter is comprised of, you do not get two slits. You get what's called an interference pattern, which is like waves. Like when water goes through something and strikes it with intensity, and then it diminishes as it goes out from the center of intensity. But scientists are confused. We shot small bits of matter through these two slits, and we get an interference pattern. How could that be? They thought maybe they were interfering with each other, because they were shooting them through as a stream of electrons. So what they do is they then take an electron voltmeter, which fires only one electron at a time. So now they're just firing one electron at a time, but yet they still get an interference pattern. There's nothing for the electron, the single electron, to interfere with, because it's going through one at a time. But they still get an interference pattern like waves. Okay? This is because at the quantum scale, matter isn't solid. It is wave energy. And the, the, the electron is leaving that electron voltmeter as a wave. And it's passing through that double slit as a wave to strike the wall as a wave. Now, scientists want, wanted to determine well, how many of them are going through one slit? How many of them are bouncing off? How many of them are going through another slit? So they put a measuring device okay, before one of the slits, and they're going to measure how many of these individual electrons are passing through only one of the slits. What happens is when they put the measuring device onto the one slit, the pattern then changes and it behaves like large matter, large pieces of matter, like macroscopic matter instead of the very, very tiny uh, subatomic particle of an electron. It stops behaving like a wave because consciousness has been introduced to the equation. And then it behaves like solid matter. It then, upon being observed here, this is called the observer effect. Upon being observed, before it goes through the slit, okay, it has to make a decision about which slit it's going to go in. It cannot act as a wave because there is consciousness introduced. So then an outcome must be determined. And that what happens is it, it is called the collapse of the waveform. So the, the particle that left as a wave collapses to a point particle and then goes through one of the slits or the other or bounces off the screen. Prior to that, it only exists as a waveform if no consciousness is introduced. So this shows us, one, matter is not solid. It is a waveform, a vibratory energy. Two, how we view ourselves, the world, 
the things that are taking place has an effect on the outcome. We are made of these particles. Okay? So introducing consciousness into the equation can have the effect of changing the end result. That's the important thing to keep in mind here. Looking at it one way may get you one thing, looking at it a different way may get you something else. The five sense illusion. The next barrier to self-realization is ego identification. So ego should be briefly defined because most people think of ego as, oh, I'm just a person who's completely full of myself, you know, and I just think that I'm so great and so better than everybody else. That isn't ego as I'm using it in this uh, idea, in this concept. Ego identification means that a person is identified with roles that they play in life. They don't see themselves as an aspect of consciousness. They see themselves as what I do, what I'm involved in, the role that I play. So I am a businessman. I am a soldier. I am an American. I am a father or a mother. Okay? You're identified with the roles that you play in life. These are simply vehicles, expressions for consciousness to have an experience in the physical world. They're not who we actually are underneath. We are the expression of consciousness, having an experience in the physical world. These are roles we play in life. They're not actually who we are. But we often tend to get into the trap of identifying with these roles so much, so completely, that we define ourselves as these roles. And that's where we can get into trouble. The next um, barrier to the uh, realization of the true self is the left brain prison. So we talked about the hemispheres of the brain and how the left and right brain play very different roles in their functions. And what we have to understand is that shut down modes of consciousness are very frequently caused by left brain imbalance. And this is, we'll talk about why that is later and what happens to the brain when it becomes imbalanced toward one hemisphere or the other. So the next barrier to the realization of the true self is what I call, what many researchers have called the left brain prison. Um, this is getting trapped in the functions of the left brain only and kind of ignoring the, the right brain functions of holistic thought and intuition. And this is a product of our culture, actually, which uh, stresses uh, reading, writing, math, verbal communication, um, written language, science, um, logic, reason, okay? And it oftentimes ignores, particularly in our educational upbringing, holistic thinking, uh, intuition, creativity, art, music, um, things like that are often de-emphasized in our uh, educational structures, uh, certainly not emphasized in our scientific establishments. And uh, this, uh, this is a, like, kind of like a, a cartoon talking about or making a commentary on uh, the differences between the uh, left and right brain. The left brain, there you see everyone in business cubicles, all with the same color, you know, all looking uh, identical, like like robots, kind of. And then on the right hand side, you see uh, people engaged in creative acts, uh, in, in uh, uh, holistic be uh, behaviors, hanging out with their family, flying kites, reading, um, you know. Uh, 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 doing creative things, art, and uh, it's, a, it's a good analysis of the dichotomy between the left and right brain hemispheres. And the tendency in our culture is to get trapped in that left brain uh, uh, modality because um, that is the part of the brain that kind of keeps us real rooted to the physical world and it, it's that which kind of is um, geared more towards staying in control. It's the dominate, dominator part, the aggressive or dominator part of the brain. 
And uh, that's why I have the image there of Big Brother from 1984, because this is what it ultimately leads to if you stay trapped in that left brain uh, uh, sense of identity, the left brain prison, uh, becoming like a dominator. The next, um, the next <coughs> barrier to the identification of the true self is institutionalized belief systems. So I call them belief systems because that's exactly what they are. Um, they are beliefs that people become attached to. They do them often because it's simply the way that they were done previously. No, if they were introduced suddenly now without any prior knowledge on them, many people would say, well, why would you want to do something that way? But because they're handed down to us by other people who just say, that's how it's done, or that's the way it is, or that's how we do this, then it's accepted but from our, our cultural uh, paradigm, our cultural way of seeing the world. And it's also interesting to note the word institution. When we say that we are committed to an institution, what do we mean by that? Are we, do, are we favoring the things that a body of people who do a certain thing, their approach to doing this are? Or are we saying, I'm being committed to a mental asylum? You know, committed to an institution and committed to an institution are the same phrase in our language. And one should think about why that may be. Why are they the same phrase even though they mean two completely different things? Language is a funny thing like that. We'll be talking a lot more about words, the meaning of words, the derivations of words, you know, how our language speaks to us in very, very uh, right brain ways if we can only break it down and really hear what's being said kind of almost symbolically. But uh, these are some institutions, you know, marriage, business, the business world, the educational world, the medical community, you have government, you have religion, you have military, you have police and paramilitary. These are all institutional belief systems. They are not institutions which are really out there to discover truth. They are institutions that are out there to tell people how things actually are in their view, in their world view, and then get them to go along with it without any actual ex examination of the facts for themselves. Therefore, they are belief systems. It works like this. Take my word that it works like this and just do what we say based on belief. Not discovery, not self-discovery, but just belief. And that's why I think that institutional belief systems are one of the biggest barriers to self-realization because they don't really take the individual into account. They absorb the individual rather than our unique, uh, rather than encourage the unique expression of an individual. With that having been said, <clears throat> uh, the next section is the true self versus the false self or the lower self. So the higher self versus the lower self. That which is the real self versus the self that is engaged in and trapped in illusion. So this is what the, the qualities of the true self are. When we are born in conscience, when we are born in consciousness, these are the qualities that the individual takes on. The true self exists in a state of dominion and non-duality. So, as they think, so they feel, so they act. And they cannot be separated from that, that uh, way of living their life, way of being in the world. A true self understands and works toward true freedom. They really grasp the concept of freedom. They understand it as the highest expression of love in, 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 the, in the world around them. And they're working toward higher and higher um, um, expressions of freedom. The true self practices alchemy to bring about the true will. So the true self is a magician in the truest sense. He is not serving his own egoic will. He is serving the will of creation. The will of 
the, the divine, that which wants to bring higher levels of consciousness into manifestation. The true self is concerned with the alleviation of suffering for all beings. That's very critical. The true self recognizes that another being's suffering is his own suffering. And he suffers, he or she suffers, as long as there is even one other being that suffers. And they realize that because their worldview reflects an understanding that there is no separation between self and others. That separation, that seeming separation, is an illusion. There is only one consciousness here. And there is really no separation when you get right down to the deepest levels of consciousness. The true self does not exist in left-brained prisonhood, and he does not exist in ego identification. He has made the energies that uh, are the seat, uh, in the seat of consciousness, uh, that in the physiology, in the brain, one. Okay? That he's united the polarities of left and right brain, of male and female, the chemical wedding, if you will, it's been called. And he, he's operating from a perspective of whole thought. Okay? And he's not ego identified. He doesn't consider the role that he is playing in the world, regardless of what it may be, father, brother, uh, son, uh, teacher, um, you know, uh, any job that he may do. He, he's not identified with that as his identity. Okay? It's not who he is, it's what he happens to be doing at any given moment. The role he's playing. The true self seeks to break down all institutionalized belief systems because he recognizes them as boxes of consciousness keeping people entrained into belief systems, into believing what they're told instead of really discovering things for themselves. So uh, the true self wants to break down these institutionalized systems. He wants to uh, limit their, their capabilities and their power as much as possible because he recognizes that institutional belief systems are ultimately an, an assault upon the freedom of the individual. And they're ultimately an assault upon consciousness when you get right down to it. Now, the qualities of the false self, the lower self, the base self, if you will. The, the, the false self exists in a state of confusion and opposition and okay? not not in a state of dominion they're in a state of internal strife they're confused seeking control and therefore they're in opposition with themselves as they think isn't how they feel and act they'll take an action in complete opposition to how they may really feel deep inside they're sinning against their emotions sinning against the spirit see and uh, this can only happen because the consciousness is shut down through fear. They ultimately exist in a vibratory energy of fear. The true self can't even envision what true freedom is. You could try to explain the conceptual idea of what freedom is, but they will not really grasp it or understand it because they're so, their consciousness is, is so ruled by the vibration of fear that all they're seeking is control to try to alleviate the internal confusion. They don't understand themselves or the world. So they just lash out through control to try to externally control events. And all they're going to do by that modality is bring more chaos and disorder into the world and into themselves, ultimately. The true self employs, often employs sorcery to bring accordance with his own egoic will, his or her, her own desires. Okay? So, um, and normal people can act as sorcerers trying to manipulate and influence other people just for their own benefit. It doesn't have to be a skilled practitioner of, of, of uh, mind control or magic. Okay? This is an everyday person can be a, become a sorcerer. And they're trying to bring accordance with their own egoic will. It doesn't matter. The divine will doesn't matter at all. It's what I want. It's all about what I want. He's concerned only with oneself and one's own. If that, 
you know, maybe my family or small circle of friends, if that. But ultimately, the focus is on my own comfort, my own happiness, my own desires, and anyone else, if, 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 uh, if it doesn't affect me in my own immediate surrounding, they can be damned. The true self has a worldview that reflects a belief that everything exists in a state of separation, even though this is not the case. They believe that because they're trapped in that left brain modality, that left brain prisonhood. The true self lives life in a state of left brain ego identification, totally identified with the roles that they play and attached to their belief systems, totally attached to what they perceive. Doesn't matter what the truth is, I'm going to think what I want about it. That's where this moral relativist stance comes in. Doesn't matter if there's a truth out there. I can determine the truth for myself or you know, whatever I want it to be. I'm the arbiter of truth. So he's in such a state of left brain prisonhood that he is completely ego identified. The role I play is all that there is and that's who I am. And the, the, the false self accepts and reinforces most institutionalized belief systems. So the, not only uh, do they accept the belief system, they enforce it themselves. They want to propagate it because they're benefiting in the physical sense, in the worldly sense, from that institution being in operation and they want to continue that. So that's the false self, the qualities of the false self, the egoic or lower self. What we've talked about all through part one so far is really the nature of good and evil. The nature of what we experience in the world within ourselves as good and what we experience in within ourselves and in the world as evil. And ultimately it's broken down to simply this way. Love is that which creates everything that is good in the world and fear is that which ultimately creates everything that is evil in the world. And these are emotional polarities. These are the forces that either awaken consciousness and make it flower or they shut consciousness down and put it into a box. And these are the things that they bring into manifestation. Love brings dominion within. It brings freedom without. It is accomplished through magic to bring about the true will through alchemy to create non-dualism. Fear is bringing evil forward through creating internal confusion, which then results in the external desire for control. It works through the process of sorcery, manipulation, and, and uh, uh, serving the egoic will to create illusion in others and ultimately opposition within the self and others. Love is sending us in the correct direction. The emotional compass is set properly when we're in the vibratory energy of love, higher consciousness. Its, its goal is oneness, to bring about the true self, to open our minds and hearts up to higher and higher levels of awareness, of consciousness, to help us to understand that we are but one thin slice of a multi-dimensional world of infinite consciousness taking place all around us. And it can help, it, it is trying to bring about a balanced brain, a perfectly balanced brain between the male and the female, the left and the right hemispheres of the brain. Because that is what will create order in the world. Okay? That all of these concepts will bring about good and order. The opposite side, evil, which works through fear, will create misdirection in life. Fear will always create misdirection. It will always throw the emotional compass off target and send us in the wrong direction because it's working to try to separate people. When you put people into fear, you're separating them and you're getting them to see everything as separate and themselves as separate from everything else. This is identification with the lower self. This is base consciousness. This is consciousness put in a box and in a trap. It's ego identification, total identification with the physical worldly roles that we play. Trapped in the five sense world. If my senses can't perceive it, it doesn't exist, even though they're very limited bandwidth, open to very limited uh, frequencies and bandwidths. 
but if my senses can't perceive it, it isn't real. And this is accomplished by keeping people in le largely in left brain prisonhood. And we'll talk now about how what these what these uh, different modalities actually bear into the world, what they birth into the world. And then we'll talk about we'll start to talk about how um, the brain can become imbalanced and how the brain uh, really is a, is a, a very significant factor when it comes when it comes to uh, how these forces work in the world. So when our thoughts are in balance, when they're in harmony, okay, we are in the vibration of love. Okay, th this is the essence of consciousness. This is the force that helps consciousness expand, and it ultimately is derived from how we think. When we are in that vibration, our emotions are acting as one, and they're helping us to create the, the, the um, unified consciousness of dominion. So as we think, we feel, we act, and we cannot be torn apart. And when we do that, then our actions are also in harmony, and we're working toward true freedom. So it happens from our thoughts, in a vibration of love, internally, our emotions are in, are, are in harmony and in check, and we're not ruled by them either. We, we own them as well. We're in dominion. Okay, So we know what's going on within. Then we put that into practice in the outside world to create freedom, which is the highest expression of love in the world. So the pyramid of love is built upon dominion within and freedom without. There's no other way to get to that state. There's no other way to create good in the world. Order, peace will come from these polarities being in operation within the self and in the outside world. You're not going to create in any other way. It's simply how the organizing principles of the world work. These are, these are the energies we are working with, and this is how they work. The opposite of this effect is if our thoughts are in complete disharmony and they're ruled by fear, we are in the fear vibration with how we think that our emotions are going to be completely out of order, often they are going to rule us instead of us using them for our benefit, and we're going to be in a complete state of confusion within. And then our actions are going to be geared toward trying to take external control over others. And the only thing that's ever going to create in the world is chaos and evil. That's all you can create with those polarities. You know, try, try to say that you're going to create good and order in the world through control is like saying, I'm going to take my wet laundry that I just washed and I'm going to dry it by pouring more and more water on top of it. You'll never dry it like that. It's an impossibility. You're adding the opposite polarity than what you want. And that's what, that's what people in fear-based consciousness in internal confusion that don't really understand the self, that have not made a study of their psychological and emotional makeup, are, are going to they're, they're, they're going to create nothing but chaos in the world through trying to control things externally instead of understanding what's really going on inside of us. So that's how that pyramid works. Now, we talked about consciousness and how it's correlated to the brain, the yin and yang energies, the left and right hemisphere of the neocortex, the human brain, okay? And what I want to talk about now is what happens when one of these hemispheres is completely dominant over the other? How, how does the whole brain begin to function when that happens? Well, the neocortex, the whole upper brain, the whole human brain is like the executive controller. It's the, the command center of the whole three sub-brain complexes. Remember, you have the neocortex up at the top of the head, the new brain, the new cortex, neo meaning new. You have the limbic brain in the middle, it's the midbrain, the mammal brain. And then at the base of the brain, you have the brain stem and the cerebellum, which is called the R complex, the reptile brain. So the neocortex, the top brain, okay, is like the CEO of the company. Let's look at it that way. Uh, this, he's the person that makes the executive decisions of the company. Now, if, if that part of the brain gets sick, 
or if it doesn't, isn't working properly, then the command functions of the whole brain complex, the three parts of the brain, have to be shunted to one of the other two brain complexes. So the, the executive functions are either going to go to the limbic brain, the midbrain, the mammal brain, or they're going to go to the lower brain, the R complex. So here's how this imbalance works. Here you see the three complexes of the brain. The neocortex, the, the limbic brain, and the, the, the R complex, or the reptile brain. If we become extremely imbalanced to the left brain hemisphere, and this is how most people become imbalanced. There are, is a percentage that become very right brain imbalanced, but there is more of a tendency to become left brain imbalanced because of how our educational system is here in the, uh, the, the Western Hemisphere. The left brain becomes dominant, and what happens is the whole neocortex starts to not function properly, and this is the part of the brain that starts to shut down, the limbic brain. See, our emotions are more cultivated through a, a holistic um, um, a cohesiveness of both brain hemispheres, particularly when we start to get in touch with our right brain hemisphere. Okay? When you're only in the left, there's very little emotional or intuitive makeup within the person. So their limbic system actually begins to shut down. Their whole neocortex isn't functioning properly because of that imbalance. So the part of the brain that takes over is the reptile brain, the R complex. And the person begins beha behaving in reptile-like ways. Controlling, dominating, hoarding, greed, um, external control over others. We see this everywhere in our culture because these people's brains are in such a state of imbalance, in such a state of neurochemically they're not operating properly. And the, the limbic brain has stopped functioning. The person is essentially cut off from their emotional guidance system of how they feel about what they do to others and they become like a reptile because they're being ruled by the reptile brain and they become cold-blooded. They don't care about what they're doing to anyone else. It's all about me. And it doesn't make a difference who I have to step on. That's what a person is thinking who is ruled by the reptile brain. Doesn't matter if it's right or wrong. Doesn't matter. It's only about how it relates to me. Now, the opposite of this is if the right brain becomes imbalanced, okay, which is a, more of a rarity, but it does happen, then the person, the neocortex shuts down again. They're not completely, but it's, it's not really functioning in, in, in the way it's intended as the executive, uh, the, the executive functions of the brain. And in this case, the person loses a lot of connection with the R complex of the brain. So they don't care about anything going on in the physical world. It doesn't matter if I'm living in a state of physical disarray. It doesn't matter if I, you know, have none of the basic necessities for survival. It doesn't matter if I'm being controlled externally from other people and my rights are being taken away or I'm being physically abused. See, because in that case, the mammalian brain, the limbic brain has gone kind of haywire and this person's being ruled by their emotional brain. You know, they don't have enough of the male tendencies because the feminine part of the brain has has overtaken their consciousness and this person their limbic system becomes the executive controller of the brain and they lose all connection with survival instincts and anything having to do with certain, you know living in the physical world so somebody who's extremely imbalanced in religion or the new age movement perhaps you know excessively meditating let's say this could be a way that the brain is imbalanced to the right hemisphere, and then the person becomes ruled by the limbic brain, the mammalian brain. And ultimately, that's what is really going on. We have people's brains being de-imbalanced and, and really being um, 
uh, put into a state of extreme unhealthiness through imbalance toward one brain hemisphere or another. Because when we get imbalanced toward the left brain, we, get, we become ruled by the R complex and we become dominators, masters. Okay? When we're ruled by the right brain, then we lose all connection with physical survival and don't care what happens to us anymore. We become ruled by our emotions and we become like slaves. So this is why this brain imbalance is really occurring. There's, there's a force out there that wants to create a world of masters and slaves, ultimately. They want the brain so imbalanced, it wants the brain so imbalanced that there's some people who are so left brain imbalanced they become dominating controllers, and some that become right brain imbalanced and they're willing to capitulate to any form of control that is thrust upon them. And ultimately, there's a little of both kinds of imbalance in most people and they become like a master and a slave simultaneously. You know, they, they, they uh, want to rule over whoever they can below them and then they'll take orders from, from whoever is above them in this hierarchy of control. So this is an actual brain scan uh, taken from a science journal of um, what the brain looks like when it becomes heavily imbalanced. This isn't uh, physical holes in the brain over here. These are areas of electrochemical deadness. So there's no neural firing in, in the black parts of the brain, the real dark areas. This, this person's brain that's labeled normal here, it's a bit difficult to see on this slide, but this person's brain is, a, is in what's called global EEG coherence. Global brain coherence. The, the electrochemical activity is distributed equally uh, about both hemispheres of the neocortex. You're looking at the neocortex from underneath, this being the top of the brain here. So this is the front of the head, that's the back of the head. Okay? So that would make this the left brain hemisphere and this the right brain hemisphere, if you could visualize that. So look, picture it as if you, you're taking the brain and lifting it up like this. Here's my, my left side of my brain. I'm lifting it up like this. You're seeing it from underneath. So that's the left brain hemisphere. That's the right brain hemisphere. I'm sorry, it's backwards. This is the left brain hemisphere here, the left brain on that side, and that's the right. So if you tilted this down this way, that would be the front of the head. Okay. Now here, the brain is labeled violent because I'll tell you about uh, the, 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 the person, uh, the, the types of individuals that were scanned for these two images. This person um, did, uh, was not given a standard Western educational upbringing, did not watch a lot of television, did not eat a Western diet, meditated uh, a small amount on a daily basis, and they have global EEG coherence. This person was brought up in a Western educational system. They watched many hours of television a day, didn't really do a lot of reading, never meditated, ate a very Western fast food type diet, and that's what their brain ended up looking like. Um, you can see that really the real damaged part, the real electrically dead part of the brain is right there on the right hemisphere. See, because they became like a controller and it's labeled violent. This person had violent tendencies and had problems, you know, behavioral issues and possibly, I'm not sure if it ended up in uh, problems with, uh, you know, uh, law, but um, uh, that's what a left brain imbalance neocortex ends up looking like. That person became very heavily left brain imbalanced and you can see all the areas of electrochemical deadness of the brain. So that's what brain imbalance does to the brain physiology. It's, it's measurable, it's provable. This is a type of scan that shows this type of imbalance and this is called a PET scan. There's other, uh, even more advanced scans called SPECT scans that you can look into to show uh, the, the, uh, the neocortex and how um, brain uh, imbalance begins to affect the uh, electro uh, the electrochemical properties of the brain. So what we're 
really going to look at in part two is how this imbalance is at work in the world and how it's ultimately creating all of the problems that we see in, in manifestation in the outside world. And what we're seeing is this that a consciousness is ultimately being torn apart in most people by the imbalance to the male energy. And it is the suppression of emotions, the sacred feminine, the Holy Spirit, the Divine Mother, the feminine aspect of consciousness, our emotions, that is really what is driving this. That, that, that our emotions are being so numbed, kept down, ignored, and ultimately killed. The sacred feminine is being killed in our world, and that's our emotional aspect of consciousness. And when that happens, the yang energy begins to dominate because we're out of touch with the feminine aspect of ourselves, the intuitive, compassionate side of who we are. And we're, we're being ruled by this yang energy, the male dominator principle of energy. When, in fact, what we need to do is unite these and help them to come into equilibrium and exist harmoniously in all individuals. That's the ultimate goal. So this is a painting by the artist Alex Gray, uh, a great spiritual artist. This is my favorite painting by him called Gaia. It's the last slide of part one. And in here he brilliantly depicts what happens when we uh, lose touch with the right brain side of ourselves. If you imagine yourself as the world tree that he's painting in this image, this would be the right brain, that would be the left brain. Okay, You're facing this way. And he shows but with uh, the, the total imbalance to the left brain, the world is on fire, there's pollution, the, there's uh, you know smog in the sky, there's rivers of blood. Um, the, the tree is completely sick and uh, it's just utter chaos. But if we get in touch with our right brain hemisphere and we unite the brain hemispheres, then we can build a world like this of peace, nature and harmony, blue skies, sun ruling the sky. And uh, it's just a great depiction of, uh, you know, what, uh, going into certain modalities of consciousness through the left and right brain can bring into manifestation in the world. And that's why I think it's a, uh, a great painting by a great artist and it's a great place to end part one. And in part two, we will look at what happens uh, when this type of brain imbalance comes into fruition in our world. And that's exactly what has happened. And we'll talk about the forces that are driving that imbalance, that left brain imbalance, and um, ultimately holding conscious, the consciousness of this planet where it currently is, because they benefit from it being held there. And we'll talk about what those forces are, and we'll talk about how they operate to accomplish this uh, imbalance within consciousness. That's the end of part one. Be back for part two. Thank you.